film really spoke to me and I don't know why uh, it did. It, uh, you know, maybe I just had to wait 50 years to find some director to, you know, appeal to me in my impaired state, you know, <laughs> or like just to dumb it down just enough. But everybody was just talking about these subjects that, that uh, I don't know if it's a middle age thing, but, you know, you start to wonder about uh, your place in the world and, 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 and try to kind of get rid of as much moral ambiguity as possible and, and, and live your life. And this was, this was encouraging that people still do talk about stuff like this. And um, I know that owner asked why it appealed to me so much. Is it because I'm Jewish? Well, if, if anything, when Kevin told me that he was going to be uh, playing a Jewish guy who became a priest, it, it really, it, it rattled me. You know, at first I was like, oh, that's too bad that he did that. But at the end of the film, I realized that this is, this really isn't about religion. It's about anyone's personal faith. And, and the way the characters in this, in this film don't really tramp on anybody's belief system, at least the, 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 the core group of them. They ask questions, they, they, they create dialogue, but at the end, they're friends. One of the most jarring moments of the film uh, is when uh, Father James comes in the first time that he meets Max's character and he says, what are you doing in here? And then cut to them all eating dinner. You know, if this was yeah. a fucking movie of the week or something like that, there would have to be, what is, what is the Paul character, character gonna do to ingratiate himself? But it was dinner time. They were all sitting yeah. down to eat, you know? Yeah, yeah. That no, stuff sure. happens. But uh, I guess what I want to ask you, and hopefully Kevin will show up, or maybe you won't. I don't know. Yeah, no, he'll sh he'll definitely he'll show, show up. So. Okay, he'll well, it's it, it's good. This, unless owner, unless you wrote this about some other kind of global catastrophe, uh, and just made you know, it, it was like, oh, I could use this for the COVID. It just didn't seem like that, and it just seemed like you guys were just right there when it happened. It must have influenced everything, and I just want to know if everyone could just go around and say, you know, when you heard about the script or when you, you saw it, if it, if you found something in there that really sort of lit a fire into you and knew that this was something special, it, if, if you did. I'll just begin by saying, you know, as a micro budgeted filmmaker, you know, I would never be able to make a movie about the pandemic, about these conditions after the fact, you know, two or three or four years down the road, I, I would never be able to, you know, raise the money to to make something where the streets are empty or just to, or have a, a church that's available the way that church was a church like that in new york or anywhere is going to cost you tens of thousands of dollars 50 60 thousand dollars a day to use probably and it was available because of covid um and because covid was happening because we were a tiny tiny crew we were able to take advantage of it and and um i it was it was it was a way to kind of embrace the dread that I was feeling and maybe that all of us were feeling and to make something in the moment. So writing the script and I think the power of the script was the fact that we were all living it and we were doing something with our dread. I, mean, I don't know if that answers the question, but I thought it might be a good way to, to, to start the conversation because um, for me, uh, that was the allure of it was being in the moment and making something in the moment, knowing that I'd never be able to do it again. You know, like the time was now to make something on the pandemic because emotionally we're all in that place and um, physically we're all in that space. So um, yeah, uh, I just tend to create and make work from my anxiety, you know, my neuroses, you know, filmmaking and, and art is therapy for me. So this is just, just another extension of that, you know, as we were going through it, it felt like we had the opportunity to do it. And luckily we have, the actors were, were, were game to do it and the uh, financiers gave us a small check. So uh, it, it all worked out and, and it felt like the right thing to do. I, I didn't think about it too much. It's just like, hey, the church is open. Let's make a movie in the church. What are we gonna make a movie about? Well, look, we're, we're in, involved in the pandemic. Let's make it about this. So that's, that's, that's just kind of my beginning assessment of all this, you know, a little bit, so. What about oh, you man. chaps? Yeah. yeah. Was that? What about you chaps? What do you think? I said yes before I even read it. I was so relieved to, to be doing another. First of all, I was just relieved to be doing any acting at that time. Um, and every time owner asks me to do something, I just say yes. 
whatever it is. I just trust him so, so much and enjoy working with him so much. So when I read the script, I knew, I knew it was what a little bit, of, I knew, I knew it was going to be good. I'm a big fan of owners writing. But Max, um, do you think you would have done anything if anybody asked you to do anything just to get yourself out of your space, you know, out of, out of the. No, absolutely know? not. No, no, yeah. absolutely not. First of all, you know, it was a risk to, you know, to, to do it during yeah. the, you know, the height of the pandemic. And no, I would not, I wouldn't do some piece of something I didn't like. Yeah. Also finding out that Kevin was in it, you know, that was a, that was probably. We, we were trying to do something, the three of us for a while, mm -hmm. me, you and Kevin. Well, I'd written a script uh, years ago called My Mother the Whore that I'd written for uh, Max and Kevin playing brothers. And actually I wrote a priest role for Thomas J. Ryan. Tom, you wrote, you read that script years ago, right? Yeah, it was so good. I, I wanted to do it. Yeah, yeah it was, it's pretty, a bunch of chamber piece. It's about a, a mother on her deathbed who convinced and confesses to her two sons that she had a very promiscuous past and she cheated on her husband and, and they have a priest come to do the last rites. It's a chamber piece, family comedy, you know, comedy of errors. I've never even understood what that means. Comedy of errors, but <laughs> is that so, but, uh, but I, we had wanted to do a movie. I wanted to do a movie with these three actors years ago. I'd written the script for them. So we, you know, we, I, I never really pursued the financial. Um, I never tried to make that happen financially. Maybe it's something we can make eventually later, but, but yeah, it was nice to bring everybody together on this one. Um, but, but yeah, um, I, I think that Max and Tom and Kevin were all, I don't want to speak for them, inspired by the cast too. You know, it wasn't just about working with me. I think the cast that we started with Kevin first and then after we got Kevin, went to Max and then Tom. And then um, I think Kevin was the bait to lure them in, you know, basically. So Everyone has such presence and such, you know, I would whatever you want to call it, if you want to call it passion. I, I, I've seen the film about four times. I was sent it, I think what maybe you sent it about a month ago, maybe a little more, yeah. when we weren't completely out of the, uh, the pandemic and the lockdown. But it, uh, it, for me, upon every viewing, sometimes I'll say, okay, this is Matt, this is the Paul's film, or this is Father James, or this is, uh, you know, Father Andrew, it, it's just, it's, to me, you guys have done such an amazing job and whether somebody has told you that, and I'm sure your friends or your family, right? It's, it's objectively a good film, but there's something here that uh, I really hope uh, catches on because it, it really brings back, I always get a kick out of when someone says, oh, if you've seen this war film, it's, it's very realistic or it's so authentic. I'm thinking, this is the first authentic film to come along where people are actually conversing. And it's conversation. I hope that it's not uh, looking at something with rose colored glasses, because I know that I talk like that. And I know that I have existential thoughts and I want to, you know, be heard and have, you know, this communion could have been called communion. You never mentioned the word in there, but it, it is communion. And I don't, uh, I think that seeing it at an, at an older age, um, I could, I could grasp certain things, you know, somebody who's been divorced like myself or moving on and having a set of, you know, some bitterness and cynicism. I think I'd written owner, well, I did today. I said, the people that come in during the film that are kind of like these harpy type characters, they're like, they're, they're specters that are, you know, meant to like shake people's faith, whether it's Craig getting the, uh, the baptism or if it's, if it's Max's girlfriend, it's just to me, it's just a great work of art. I didn't want it to end, but I'm, I might be very singular in that case. But for, for, for uh, Thomas, what, have you played a priest before? No. No, no I, I relate to what you're saying about middle age. And uh, I think I find myself at a particular time in life when I'm, I was raised very strict Catholic. Uh, I went to boys Catholic school with all of the fear and dread and also uh, inspiration that that brings. And I've walked like many Catholics, I walked away from religion at the age of 17 or 18. And I lived very confidently without it for most of my life. And now I'm questioning things. And the peace just came along at that time. And it respected faith. And the respect, hi, Kevin. The respect for faith is uh, is was unique. You 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 don't you, you you don't read that kind of point of view often, and I was quite surprised to read it coming out of Orner. 
uh, and, and really excited because, you know, it takes somebody who is actually very um, suspicious and um, cynical a, a lot of times to actually go to the heart of, of something without any sentiment or, or cloying. Uh, I, I thought it was written so well because it was Orner. Somebody who naturally gravitates to that point of view might not have written it uh, with the detail uh, and love that he wrote it with. And we didn't want to be, I, there's I definitely, because I, I don't, I'm an idiot. I feel like I don't know anything. So from a cynical point of view or a place of uncertainty, we didn't want to approach it like with certitude, like, oh, there is no God or there is a God, or if you're not saved, you're going to burn in hell. You know, all of it was, the idea was keeping everything open so that uh, no one felt like they were being condescended to, you know? This, and, and again, I wanted to write a philosophical film based on, you know, my own curiosity. Max's character is basically representing me, the person who doesn't know a lot, but who's looking for something. So he, you know, he, he is basically my character, but also Max's character is based on a lot of what he was going through at the time, you know, the divorce, he was going through a divorce and things. So, um, yeah, I thought for me, when I was, when I was writing and working on it, it was a matter of having the perspective of all these great actors and also just gentlemen with their own unique points of view, um, giving me advice or, or notes on how to make the script better and the film better. And I would rewrite based on everybody's notes. So it was a very collective experience, you know. Did Not you write know, specifically with them in mind? Um, I wrote it for Kevin um, and then, uh, there were a few, not not to begrud not to begrudge Max or Tom, who were, were brilliant actors. There were slightly bigger names and older actors that were a little bit older that um, we'd approached, but they didn't want to do it because of COVID and stuff. This is not, to, and I and I'm very lucky that they didn't. They're do lost. It, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but I but I wrote it for 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 Kevin, and then um and then um approached Max and Tom. They were right up. There was like one person ahead of Tom, basically, that we approached, you know, beforehand, so, yeah. Max, what did you think, what did, what did you think of, uh, I mean, if, if you were going through these things, I, I would imagine that the, uh, the words that, that owner wrote had some resonance with you, and you could, was that the case? Yeah, but we, from what I had initially read, owner and I, I um, made it more specific. Like this confession scene between me and Kevin in the pew is really kind of a confession scene to me. Um, I told owner I wanted to make it a little more specifically without going into details what I was, what precisely what I was going through with my breakup of my marriage. Feeling but, like you, you destroyed your own marriage and things like yes, that. Yes. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that's That's one of the shifts. My favorite scenes in the movie shifts, but that's uh that's right up there. It's one of my favorites. Just when when they have the conversation about the link between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and then basically Father Andrew is just having that nice, quiet conversation with uh, with Paul, and he says, "Call your father." And then they're talking about you know Paul destroying his own life. You know, plus so, my my loathing for the corporate takeover of our city and and the world. So I we got I, I got a little some shots in there. I I, I told owner. Yeah. I wanted. Yeah. Cool. We that, that that scene was originally a lot more preachy. There was a, it went a lot longer than that. We cut it down because we didn't want it to sound like a a guy on a soapbox saying this is what's wrong with New York again. The certitude aspect that we didn't want it to ever feel like we were that we had any answers that we knew anything, you know. And I guess that's the idea of faith. It's all predicated on hope as as opposed to absolutely knowing, you know. So nice to see you, Kevin. Hi, nice to see you too, Steve. You're a nice man. Tom, Thanks for joining Corey, us. Max. Good to see you, Kevin Corrigan. Brilliant Kevin Corrigan. The amazing Kevin Corrigan. I, Kevin, I told them when, when you, you had said to me, you sent me a picture of you in a, wearing what is the, the collar. Uh, I, I, I think I thought of there's a famous Jewish bishop. I think he was an archbishop or something. He was one of the main, he was a big Catholic priest in France <laughs> called Lustiger, who was hidden by a family during the Holocaust. And I think he was hidden by a convent and he became Catholic and went up the ranks. And, uh, but I thought that, you know, when you first told me that I was like, wow, how does that work? And I wonder if any 
anyone's ever done that other than this famous guy. But at the end of watching the film, I thought, who cares what this guy believes in or what he doesn't, you know? And even if it was motivated to uh, piss his father off, which would piss any Jewish father off, no matter if he's uh, atheist or not, but it, it, it shows that uh, the father was very, I guess he was proud of his son at the end. It was something that it became a little lighter afterwards, after watching that, like a weight off his back. And did you, uh, how do you prepare for a, a, a role as a, to be a Jew who becomes Catholic? I mean, you were raised Catholic, but how do you, you know, other than throwing in the line like Mazel Tov, I bought you as a Jew. I, you know, I don't know. I, I didn't really think about it, I, to be honest. And, um, and I, I, I had some reassurance from an old teacher of mine, uh, old, uh, a mentor, a, a, an acting teacher that I that I've had when I was a teenager. And I check in with him, you know, he, he's like a guru figure. You know, he's, you know, if acting's a religion, this guy, Jeffrey Horn is, you know, a, 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 a shaman, you know, of like a really respected man in the field of, of, of uh, dramatic instruction. I used to uh, work in the theater he taught classes in. I used to sweep the floors and wash the bathrooms and where Jeffrey Horn taught <laughs> at Theater 22 on 22nd Street and 6th oh. Avenue. Maybe that was, this was in the 80s. It's possible. In the 80s. It's possible, you know, he, uh, he had like, um, I know he's had like a private class that he does outside of the Strasbourg Institute. Anyway, you know, he told me, you're, you're, what are, you're Puerto Rican, right? You're Irish and Puerto Rican. Well, then you know what it feels like, you know, to be an outsider, you know, don't worry about that. You know, just, uh, it's the same advice he's given me for a while, like think about what this man feels, you know, and what, you know, what are his sure connections in life? Because we have, everyone has sure connections. It's what he calls it. That uh, are the foundation of, of, of your, your, your uh, self-image and your sense of identity. Your job, if you have one, your family, if you haven't, you know, lost them for whatever reason. Uh, your profession, you know, he says, I have my acting job. I mean, I don't know how, I don't know how much longer I'm going to have it because we were having this conversation during the pandemic, you know, I said, I'm going to work on this, this movie. And uh, he, 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 uh, he couldn't leave his apartment. He really couldn't because he's, uh, you know, in his eighties. So he was really vulnerable and was kind of, learning how to teach like this to teach acting the way we're talking now on zoom and you know then then he was afraid at the, the at the end of the pandemic that he wouldn't be able to go back to the old way of you know being with people and teaching people in person which is like you know what these is what the the, the fathers want in the movie is to open the doors again and and and, and be in communion with the people, with the parishioners. And that's what it's about. So all like the sort of the, the dog, the Catholic and, and uh, 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 Jewish dogma, like I, I didn't really want to get hung up on that. Uh, I didn't think that's, you know, like, and, and it was the, the, car, the part was kind of a blank slate, you know, apart from that. He's a blank slate, you know, like Max's character is a lost soul and he comes, you know, uh, well, I don't know if he comes looking for, for salvation or guidance or he's just lonely, you know, but uh, that's, I, I guess, you know, uh, uh, religion perhaps comes down to, to loneliness and how we deal with it, you know, how we deal with our place in the universe. Are we alone? Is there anybody out there, you know? And I love how this, this movie goes there, goes there, goes to that, that place that I've 
always loved going since I was a teenager to sit down and listen to Dark Side of the Moon and think about the, you know, about life and and get drunk and just get bombed, you know, hanging out with, uh, you know, people who are also trying to understand that void, fill it or fill that void or, or just understand it. Um, I'm talking about uh, um, you know, I mean, the film is talking about death. It's a, it's about. It's like the guy. It's like Tony Hendry and Spinal Tap because we, you know this is this is a classic. What do I? You know this death is like a great subject. Death sells. Yeah, it's gonna be right. a hit with the black. He's trying to convince yeah, yeah, yeah. Every, the every band. You know this yeah. is the right thing. Yeah. Um, I, I think you don't know. You just don't times. know it's the right thing, right? Um, I'll it's... say as a as an eighth atheist from my family growing up, I gravitated not to the dogma at all, but I was always jealous and fascinated by the communities within churches and synagogues. Um, I was always loved it. Like uh, I always wanted that. I didn't believe any of the stuff in the Bibles or anything like that, but I just, I liked, I used to go and sit in churches when I was a teenager and like listen to Mozart and try to like find some peaceful, like something or other. I don't know. It's just, I liked the, I, we used to do read, play readings in churches and stuff like that. Um, I just liked being there. And then I would also do the same thing with the in synagogues and the, the communities like if you don't, you're in like, in my, I had no community. It was me and my parents. And I guess, you know, the political meetings they would host in their, in, a, in our house, it was not a community. I mean, they were grown ups. you know what I mean? It's like when I see my ex-wife's father, so my father-in-law, my ex-father-in-law is a rabbi in Israel. And uh, we went there and I think it's all batshit crazy, frankly, all this hyper-religious uh, behaviors and all the praying they do every five minutes but my god the community of this he lived in uh, we visited him in this place called Beit Shemesh which is all uh, Haredi Jews and uh, it was wow. like it was during Passover Pesach right and they're all out there burning all the filthy sh stuff in the house and yeah. uh, and they're all it's all they're all doing it together man and then like um, and then we went to this um, someone's house for the for the Seder <clears throat> and it was huge table with uh, all the children and it was like it was i mean it was just amazing man and like i had i had none of that growing yeah, up yeah i think all that stuff's really what's beautiful i mean i think that's why making a movie about community and a church setting makes sense during a pandemic because i mean the fact that it brings people together for a common good how is get people getting together to pray and dedicating their lives to reading the Bible and studying the Bible. How is that something to be mocked or made fun of? Yet people can spend 30 hours a week binge, binge watching crappy TV shows. Right. And it was like, that's fine. That's great. Let's write a ton of uh, articles about it. But then it's just like anything, when anything comes down to like truly devout faith, it, it's like, it's mocked. Like, oh, how absurd. What a waste. It's like, there's a lot of beauty in religion, you know, I'm not a- Yes, but I think people also feel the urge to push back against the ugliness of religion, the dogmatic nature of religion. As a Catholic, I, I, I've been in a push and pull with that my whole life. The, the, the fact is, you know, just when you decide religion is your warm blanket that's gonna comfort you in a cold night, you get kicked in the teeth by the dogma, by the judgment, by um, the, the, the severity sometimes yeah. of the real Catholic dogma. So yeah, I, I'm like 50-50 on this because I vacillate back and forth. And it's a, a really, uh, it's a lifelong thing that, that you're in conversation with if you're a Catholic. It's not some easy you know, leap to say, okay, I'll, I'll believe. It'll be so comfortable, it'll be so comforting you pay a price yeah, because yeah. you have to shut down a part of your questioning mind, <laughs> you know, and uh, some people can do that and uh, good for them. Mazel tov. I, I'm always, I can't, 
there's always that part of my mind that goes, oh, you've got to question this. That's not right. <clears throat> Snakes don't talk. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're talking about other things too, like the, um, the, the shunning of specific lifestyles, right? And saying that's evil, that's wrong, that is, um, then there's specific things about- Oh, for God's sake, yeah, so that's obvious. But like just, just now we had the bishops saying that they wanted to deny Joe Biden the, uh, taking communion because a lifelong dedicated Catholic man because he is publicly pro-choice. So um, yeah. now the bishops are in an argument with, uh, with Rome about this issue. And it's just like, this is exactly what kept me away, away from the Catholic church for 40 years. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the, the very idea of that. So yeah, they're, they're horribly dogmatic and difficult for gay people or for unmarried people who have sex or people who use birth control. But it's just like the, the hypocrisy is something that is very hard to ignore. And yet the faith and the beauty of it and the community as Max was talking about is really something that late in life you circle back around and rediscover that. Doesn't mean so much when you're 20, those things. You don't need to be comforted, you're 20. Mm. You know, your community is your friends, you know. Yeah, you bring something to um, the, the part which is so human and very relatable and likable. Uh, are, you, do you, are you able to compartmentalize your, well, obviously you're a professional, but when you compartmentalize the things uh, that you don't agree with in that run that, 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 are, that contrast with your core beliefs, uh, when you play a role like that, and you said this is the first time you've played a uh, man of the cloth, when you do that, do you do you think uh, you know about your life leading up to that? Your experiences that might have been positive in the Catholic Church, or did you like any priests, or did anyone have an impact that was positive? Of course, many people of uh, many people did. Um, uh, but one of the fun things about acting, to me, is advocating for somebody that maybe in life you wouldn't advocate for, or a position that you wouldn't. Uh, necessarily. I, I, I did have, you know, the Kevin was talking about his acting teacher. I had one in high school who was a priest who was like really supportive of me becoming an actor when I was 15, 16, 17. And, uh, you know, this man was a, a great influence, a very, you know, I thought he was gay. I was sure he was gay. He was the drama teacher. You know, it was like... <laughs> We've all, we all know this guy, he's a wonderful guy. And you just say, well, God bless him. He's alone. He, there was never any hint of a relationship or a family. He was just this great man who was a priest and somehow he had sorted all of this out. That's kind of why I wanted to bring this gay undertone to my character here is because these guys, these priests, you know, I was always curious about them. And where, where, where did all the libido go? Did it just evaporate? Did it, did it actualize? Did it do different things for different people? And what, did, what price did they ultimately pay by not speaking about that part of their lives? What cumulative thing happens when you're 50, 60, 70, when you, you, you shut that down for so long? Um, and, you know, Orner and I had a really beautiful exchange about this because it was not his intent in the script. And I read it as a subtextual element. I said, you know, it'd be great if that's in the back of my mind. It would help me playing all this anger and difficulty I'm having. If I just keep that in the back of my mind, the audience will never know that. And then he wrote a scene. And uh, where it sort of ha comes out when I'm talking to Kevin in the confessional booth. And that, to me, was a great relationship between <laughs> what, when I have a writer director like that, who, who hears my little private thought and then makes it something beautiful in the movie. Um, but I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud to have brought that color into this into the tapestry of what this movie's about, because the movie's about so many other things. But there's a little corner of it that is about this lonely man who's lost his husband 
but everybody's just talking to him like he's lost a coworker. Yeah. You know, and he can't talk about that. And I just thought that was a really rich color. It was subtle um, too. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, and I've talked to people who didn't get that at all out of that scene. I'm yeah. like stunned by that. But I but you know, people who are like, oh yeah, he really loves the the guy who died. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> no, they're they're ab- absolutely I think the same thing. I've had people that say, are they they, were, they they love each other? So what is it? It's like, no, they were lovers. They were lovers for 20 years. Yeah. And <laughs> and what I love about it is that you know, Father James, we just see his tough exterior for the whole film. And to see you break down like that, it's just I think it's so cathartic and beautiful. And it both humanizes Father James in a, in a really beautiful way, but also really adds Father Brooks, a layer of Father Brooks, who's you know, we, we never see in the movie. Movie, it gives him such an added you know component to the movie that we don't see also it does another thing which i really love which is i think catholicism does you know get blamed disproportionately for its homophobia and i feel like a lot of i grew up i know a lot of christians and a lot of christians even though uh, you know in, in in conservative Christianity, homo- homosexuality is supposed to be wrong. It's supposed to be a sin and all that stuff. But but most people are okay with it. You know what I mean? And I think the Christianity gets a bad rap for being judged for its homophobia. Like that defines it. Like that's a big percentage of it. Like it's a, it's, it's a hate filled religion that people and they don't and they don't like they hate gay people. They should all burn in hell. I mean that's there's a right. I, I think you're right about that, Warner. But I also think this goes to. Kevin's going to recognize this as a Catholic, what we call salad bar Catholicism, which is you just take the parts you like, and then you don't take any of the parts that you, you don't like, you're, you're uncomfortable with, you know, I want to use birth control, so I'll just not take some of that from the salad yeah, bar. Yeah. I'll just move past it, and then I'll somehow rationalize that I'm still a good Catholic. And you might be a great Catholic, but it is sort of selective. And mm-hmm. you'd rather not talk about the other things, yeah. even though some other people are doing real damage to other people by concentrating on those things. Yeah. Yeah. You'd yeah. rather just not. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I, it, I, it, would be, it would benefit the Catholic Church to, to take more of a side uh, to, to support you know, the, the community, the, the gay I don't community. Know. I don't know if that'll ever, but, but you know, but the fact that, you know, that Father Andrew is just able to shrug it off and say, yeah, I knew this already. Let's move on. Like, I think yeah, it's, such it's a beautiful, fantastic. you know, because as, as, as powerful and as dramatic and as devastating the, 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 uh, the confession is, at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, I know you loved him. I know you were lovers. Like, I, I know that. And I was, I'm totally fine with it. And well, that's your business. stroke of brilliance, Orner, to have him respond like that, because that to me is, is speaks to the Catholics you're talking about who are, it's a new generation, it's a new day. People aren't caught up in this conversation all the time, like in the old days. And that's what I love about what Kevin brings to that conversation. It's like, yeah, but I thought there was something that you needed to confess. Why would you need to ever confess that you loved a person? It's, It's just, it's beautiful. Yeah. And people, I think, have a, a, um, a, this strange need to 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 make a big deal about certain things like oh my god I've just been told that this person's gay or this person has COVID or whatever it might be where um, you know the average idiot's going to be feel like they have to have some kind of um, dramatic response to to what's going on maybe maybe they have legitimate reasons for being alarmed but i think a lot of time they don't but they don't know how to to navigate that that uh that ra- that ramble or that uh rapid or something and it's just kind of it's it's as simple and as difficult and uh, as as um you know just just fucking pushing through it you know like like yeah i get that i get it sometimes what's all that needs to be said is like i understand or yeah i I can appreciate that or um that kind of thing you know you can diffuse many arguments by just saying i get it saying to the other side i get it you know saying to your your husband or your wife, like I get it. 
thank God for saying, yeah, so if you were, if you, if you didn't say that, you know, if, if another hour went by, if another day <laughs> went by, if another year of another 10 years went by without you just acknowledging, you know, the efforts I'm making in this relationship, I was going to just commit suicide or break up or I don't know. It's like, oh shit, I had not, I would have said it more often if I knew the stakes were that high. Right. <laughs> what was I waiting for? <laughs> My ego was in the way. I love your fish, Steve. Oh, which Those one? Oh, the, um, the, yeah, it's a Japanese thing. Uh, by the way, very totemistic. <laughs> really, uh, yeah, well, I love, I love everyone's background. Right. There's a lot of art. It's just art. <laughs> Thanks, all over man. The place. You know, there's my she grandma. May well. she uh, rest. Easy. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, talk about, you know, community. Look at this community. It's a community. But no, yes. but I, I think that it, in the end, and again, with an age thing, like I really, and having been married, I realized, like, I don't give a shit if I win any conversation, any, any kind of, uh, you know, dialogue, it just doesn't really matter. And in a sense, I got that from these characters uh, that they were just at a place in life, maybe because of the outside uh, tumult and craziness that they were willing to hear each other out because they know that it was a life or death type of thing. Uh, I, my, one of my favorite scenes, and it, and it changes, I'll be the one guy at the convention for the uh, scenes from uh, an empty church. I'll have my own table. I'll be like, let's talk about this film. But no, but the, there is like, there's this, I think it's uh, Paul who brings it up. You know, there's something uh, either nihilistic or self-serving about everybody who wants to be alive at the time where the, where the world ends. You know, people have been talking about uh, Armageddon for generations and generations, and they don't live to see it. But it, for the first time, you guys actually address it. And anybody who's in any of these doomsday cults and everything, I'm thinking, haven't they figured out the world's going to keep fucking going on? Like George Carlin said, it's going to like shake us off like a bad case of fleas. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah so, we're the 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 Earth's not going anywhere. Right, we are. We, we are. are. We are. Yeah. yeah. George Carlin, he he definitely his hit monologue. It, <laughs> it definitely um, that informed the scene where Paul's with his girlfriend and she's talking about how pandemic is going to continue to happen as far as the, the the talking about the end of the world conversation you know and, and and hearkening back to kevin saying just drinking with friends and having death like having drinks uh in college and having dinner and drinks with friends and getting drunk these kind of things would come up you know what i mean i guess when i was a little more uh i, I don't know when i felt like i knew something or felt like i could contribute to a conversation and that my two cents mattered Talking about um, existentialism, what happens when we die, if life has any meaning, if would you like to be here when the world happens? Those were conversations that we would just have. And they were always fun to talk about because if I felt like if I was eight, if I right now I'm 49 years old, I'd like to live to be 80. I'd like to, I don't see that happening, but that would be great if that were to happen. But if I had a choice to live to be 80, and die on a deathbed or whatever, or live to be uh, 79 and die with the rest of the world, what would I rather have? I think I'd rather be here when the world ended. I think, I'd like to think that just because um, of, of the collective uh, experience of it all. But uh, again, which is addressed in the movie, it, it was just a fun thing to, you know, it's like talking about food. It's like talking about sex. <clears throat> universal concepts that we can all talk about without having to have researched them. You know what I mean? We're all gonna die. We all have to be faced with it. Um, and uh, Armageddon, whether or not that happens collectively or not, we're all going to experience our own Armageddon. You know, we're all going to, one of us, we're going to get cancer, we're going to die in some way, and something tragic is going to happen. So. The hardest part of dying is that everybody else, the party goes on without you. Yeah. So that's well, one of the hardest things about the thought of death is not just your death, but that everything is going to continue on without you and you will be forgotten. Yes. And then um, you're going to die alone. You're going to die alone. Everything's going to keep well, going. Yeah, you're born alone. You're going to die alone. So this thing about, wouldn't it be great if we all went out together 
It's like, well, yeah, it solves that because problem, no one yeah. wants to be have told, hey, you got to leave the party now. The party's yeah. going on without you. It's not going to go that without stops. you. Yeah. <laughs> this is the final party. It's selfish. It, if I got to leave, everyone's fucking <laughs> leaving. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I haven't thought about it that way. That's that's a good point, though. It, it, it is going to end. The buck stops here with me. Everybody together. Yeah. yeah. It's like, sorry, it's not about you. You know what I'm saying? It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for sure. Was it? I, I, of all the scenes in the film, like I mean, you guys could go uh, from director to uh, cast member. I mean, were there any specific scenes that that have stuck in your head uh, in terms of poignance, in terms of, of just something on script that you really thought was something special, and that you were thrilled when it came out and you saw how it, it you know, in, in its final state. Before we go into that, Steve, I just want to say one more thing too regarding the conversation about the end of the world. That conversation had to be in there just so Paul could point out, I think, one of the things that is alarming, I think, about religion like Islam and like Christianity is that in order for, you know, um, the pro for, the, for the Bible to be validated, for Jesus to return, the world has to end. And I think that, that contradiction had to be addressed somewhere in the movie. And, that and, and talking about the end of the world allowed Paul to bring that out, you know? Like, right. at the end of the day, that is why that was in the movie just to bring that out there. Again, for Paul, who doesn't really have a belief system to sit there and question the, the good natured aspect of Christianity, if the world has to end, how can Christianity be a good thing, you know, necessarily? I'll just say that. And then- No, um, but, in but of all the belief systems in the film, it seems like Paul's is always emerging, even to the point where he's, you know, his girlfriend says, you know, why do you keep talking about Jesus? There is something, it's beyond the fact, and one of my favorite lines is, uh, why do you come here? I enjoy your company. I mean, it could be just that, but something else is is having an effect. Now, the the being able to see one's soul come out of your mouth, I would, you know, that's fine. You know, when the chick was leaving and saying that I could get you mushrooms or DMT or something, I was like, yeah, yeah, maybe that would be a good idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Um, absolutely. Anybody um, want to comment on yeah. speak to well, that? Well, you know, maybe you know Max. Uh, I mean, uh, Paul's the character of Paul. He's he's lost at sea. Any f form of of uh, buoy or flotation device that he can grab onto, he's going to do it. And there's that sort of dynamic in a way where you know he's he's got his 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 arm around. Uh, Father Andrew at one point is like, ah. Yeah, uh, don't makes me uncomfortable. I mean, it's true, you know, there were so many root causes for the, the awkwardness of the moment, but he's also there to, to, to question everything there. And, and it's like, um, because, as a, you know, I, I, it's, a, it's an expression of his anxiety and his need to, to, to grab onto a flotation device, yeah. you know? And it's like, okay, man, but don't, I'm not, you know, it's like, you know, if, if you're drowning, you know, you, you sometimes you, you take people with you, you know? And um, his, uh, you know, like sometimes that, that degree of uh, passion and, and the nature of that kind of like, you know, uh, self self preservation, you know, the urge to 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 um, or or to die trying to preserve to hold on to your life. I'm thinking of like, frankly, the like the fucking nine eleven guys who flew to flew the planes. You know, that was in the news again recently. In terms of the uh, uh, someone tweeted us something about. Bravery. You don't talk to me about bravery, you know, and uh, uh, cowardice or something. You know, those right. people weren't cowards and all this. And, and Who asked him? Bill Maher lost his TV show for saying that, basically saying that they weren't cowards. You know, it's his say it literally you say, say a lot. They were not cowards. You could say a lot about them, but cowardice is not one of their flaws. I, I, I mean, and if only they were the, cowards, man. But the, the, if only they were. If, if there were only, you know, if only individuals or groups who were who were just as as passionate in what they needed to do and needed to express 
but the message was the opposite. If it was, you know, uh, uh, to 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 build up something or to to uh, to to let off a a chain reaction of 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 loving feelings. Yeah. Why does why why did those men have why did that energy prevail? Why does negativity and good or evil, if you will, so often pre prevail? It's a good um, question. And uh, uh, and I I I think it's it it it, it is like you know th their their life is on the line, you know, and they're going to cut your throat. The same could be said about our own like uh, default mechanism to focus on negative qualities in people than the positive ones and uh you know that's that seems to be like I'm, I'm wired like that where i'll i'll remember a bunch of things that you know either one of my parents did but forget they would send me to camp every summer you yeah, know yeah, give me the greatest yeah, right. the greatest you know when you're on like a, a, a um on the subway and you know we're in this you know just you walk some by, by somebody who's 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 just got nothing and nothing to lose, and they want to you know will often want to 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 fuck with your reality, mm -hmm. you know. If you don't have any change, <laughs> give them, <laughs> and uh, uh, which I, I I can't say I I always do, but I I I. I try to always have uh, just Our something change. to. I, I, I gave somebody twenty bucks the other night in Times Square, man, and and I changed that guy's life for for the next two hours. You know, he was only looking to get like a hot dog, and you know, the the first thing I I grabbed in my pocket, you know, I was like. Please let it be a single. <laughs> it, was, it was a twenty dollar bill. I'm like, you're a lucky day, my friend. You know, well, you must I'm, have been I'm not going to be like, oh, you can't have that. You, well, you must have been in a very things. generous spirit. What, what was it? You know, because <laughs> I, I, take this. Take just take all my money, man. Take it. <laughs> you know, fucking get a fucking steak dinner. Fuck, man. Yeah. You know, get I always, some, I get some do that salvation. I... Get some shelter. Get some love. Get some, you know. Keep that expression on your face for as long as possible, you know. Yeah. Uh, um, and we fist bumped too, man. That was a beautiful part of it. I'll Never give see, I'll, uh, I'll, in I'll, South a real moment in in the city in New York City. Yeah. Down on like Forty Fourth and Seventh uh, Avenue. Yeah. Well, the, uh, Max, you said something about you know that you you contributed to that that monologue you know in your little confession to Father Andrew that. You know the city meant so much to you, and it's a uh, you know it, it's sort of a trope that I've heard. But you know, I remember going to New York for the first time when I was fourteen and walking to the village and buying a joint in Washington Square Park and getting high and going to like Folk City or something like that. And I was just so it I I was aware that the world was so great to me. But I've since gone to New York so many times and it doesn't exist anymore. So I'm not really part of that conversation. But do you guys? All New York actors, film director, is—is is it really as bad as as you think in 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 its worst state? Like you know that the corporations are taking over. Is this something that needs to be uh, fixed? Yeah, I think they should. I was hoping they'd all get the fuck out and stay out when, when when cities shut down. I mean, no such luck. I still love the city with all my being. I mean, I adore it. I love my neighborhood. Uh, they still can't ruin it for me. Um, but I, I'm old enough to remember New York when it was affordable and when it had a little more character because people could afford to live here and the, and the shops and the restaurants that were like cultural institutions have been just run out of fucking out of the city, out of existence because some jerk off raised the rent, some astronomical way, you know, this kind of like rampant rapacious capitalism, I you know I, Full disclosure, I was raised by communists. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, I can't even bear to go into Times Square anymore. I mean, Times Square was always bright lights and uh, commercialism. It was also, you know, 
triple X movie houses, prostitutes, drug dealing, all kinds of dangerous shit going on there. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I can't stand, I don't find what it is now to be an improvement on that. But have you guys heard of what's happening like in Washington Square Park? Like supposedly yeah. like- Yeah, I, I'm finding this interesting conversation because it kind of sounds like well, a conversation I would have had two years ago. Like, you know, oh, it's so clean and squeaky now. Pe people have gotten shot in Times Square every week for the past five weeks. There have been shootings in Times Square. It's, wow. it's, it's like, and Washington Square Park, if you dream of getting a joint, the joint is the least of what you'll get in Washington yeah. Square Park right now. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's good or bad, uh, I guess, depending on what you think of it. But it's like the city is changed. It's shifted in the last year. It'll shift back, I think. I don't, I don't think that this has much to do with capitalism. I think it has to do uh, with a certain kind of people fleeing right. and a certain kind of people staying and um, a certain, uh, you know, shifting of where there's order in the city and where there's less order in the city. Times Square used to exist around the theater district. It used to be a place that sort of grew up out of that. That's gone. Within the absence of that, who's in the giant Marriott Hotel? I mean, who's who's there? And so you have the, the a shift in where people are congregating and why they're congregating and it, it's it's a different moment right now this is, i think city. completely it's completely related to the to the absolute like upward transition of wealth that you see all around new york city with these glass towers going up that they're mostly empty and you're going to have crime elevated going through the roof as more and more people are pushed to the edge of like surviving, like they can barely, and this this is always this is like history repeating itself over and over again. It's like this, it's like a, this huge like high and low, you know. Yeah. And you don't even yeah, see any old people anymore. You know, it's everyone's just so young. I miss seeing old people. You know, I remember one time I went to New York. I was walking. Uh, and I asked this old lady where Orchard Street was and her response was, I grew up on Orchard Street. And I was like, oh, I missed that kind of you know, yeah. exchange. Maybe it's only a New York thing, but it's like she wasn't going to tell me where it was until she told me that she grew up there. Oh, it's wonderful. You know, the culture shock when I, the, the few times I've been to Paris, it's like the amount of old people on the streets are, in, it's, it's, it's so inspiring. And you don't really see that in New York. Like I haven't thought about, you know, thought of it. for me, like in terms of like, what I think is um, a really gauging the temperature of the culture of the city is like, you know, music uh, stores and bookstores and tattoo parlors and mom and pop gnarly stores. And I feel like those things aren't, we don't have as much as that as there needs to be in New York. I'm not a native New Yorker. I've been here for 10 years, so I can't speak to this, but like, uh, it, it, it feels like there's a lot of restaurants and a lot of Walgreens and a lot of pharmaceutical places and uh, restaurants and restaurants and restaurants. But, but I don't know. I feel like there should be more music venues and more record stores and more bookstores. And like, and I know books are probably not as fashionable now because of the internet, but I don't know. I feel like that is, missing and, it, and, it, and probably the reason is there's not a lot of profit in, 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 in selling books and when the rent is so fucking high how can you open a bookstore or a record store when you know it, it's insanely expensive to, to you know an art it, it, so anyway i don't know i'm curious to know what kevin thinks about it having being a, 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 a native new yorker um well i was in times square like i said the other night saturday night last saturday night What's tonight? Thursday? Week's gone by already. We're here for 10 minutes, guys. 10 minutes. Isn't that what Tony Roberts says to Woody Allen and Annie Hall? It's like trying to tell them, you know, live, live for the moment, uh, whatever he says. And uh, twins, Max. But the, 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 yeah, right. Uh, I don't know, man. It, it was fine. You know, like I, I actually thought, um, I thought, um, um, it seemed like there were a lot of New Yorkers out to me. Like it, it, it was, 
you know, you saw some tourists, but there was a, just a lot of like New York people walking around Times Square. Like, yes, Times Square has changed. It's, it's, it's physically changed. And, um, and, and there's, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the tourists went away during the pandemic. Everybody went away. Everybody went away. And now, uh, the, um, I mean, I'm not there every day. So I don't know what the crowd is like every day. But when I was out there on Saturday night, it was like, it felt very, the people felt untouristy to me. Not the lights sure. and the whole, the, 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 uh, the makeover of the, of the, the place itself, but just, it, it's, it seemed like, um, you know, there were just a lot of people from the Bronx and Brooklyn and Queens walking around. <clears throat> it's, you know, it's, it's, it's ours too. <laughs> it's not just, you know, I want to say, I, wanna say I think this. we're having like the, the classic, the only New York has this kind of conversation happening about it all but some, the time, you know, generation and generation. Like, it's like we're, we're always wanting to say, God, 20 years ago, this city was so great. And um, because this city is has been built on the idea that it's torn, you mentioned Paris, nothing changes in Paris, great city, but there's not a new building in Paris. They preserve everything as it was in 1890 and it's gorgeous. But here we build something we're proud of and then we tear it down 20 years later and we build something else. We, it's been so for 400 years in New York City. And, you know, I often wonder with these conversations like sit around and say, oh God, in the 1880s, it was so good here. What the fuck has happened to this town? I bet they did. I bet they did. And I bet, you know, in 20 and I, years. And I bet that there's some, you know, two people in Paris talking about it too. Yeah. Because I'm under yeah. the impression that, that this is a, a worldwide phenomenon or trend or pattern or, you know, the same old thing. It keeps coming back. It just, it's like, hey, they were talking about this a hundred years ago and a thousand years ago and um and and i'm i'm thinking that it's happening in everywhere you know two two you know uh two, two guys in rome are talking about how how much better rome used to be <laughs> or whatever wherever it's anywhere you you name it there's some you know group of people you know with a uh you know a vanishing tokyo uh, website, you know, or maybe not. I don't know. I, I've been so few. I've traveled so little. But yeah, you, you know, I I agree with with Max about you know. Uh, uh, I relate to the idea of like, uh, there's nothing that could happen in this place that would really make me leave, you know, and uh, um, and um, it's just why why is that, you know. When it's 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 uh it's so easy for other people to to make the decision to move. It's like yeah, we're gonna I'm gonna live uh you know in an island. It's like unthinkable. We should come down to the island. To the uh, it's it's uh you know you just take you know, come down to Florida. It's two hours <laughs> and it's really cheap. I live twenty minutes from the airport, man. We can go down to Key West, and it's like. I like it here, you know. Yeah. I like. I really like it here. It was leaving leaving New York. Crazy is, hot is yesterday. I was like on the I, subway. I think. I think the same thing. It's like I think I'm always telling myself I got to leave. It's time to get out of here. I've been here a decade. But then I think to myself, it's the people, you know. I'm, it's the people that inspire me here. I've been super inspired since I've been here, and the people that are, you know, you got to have to be have a certain mindset to be in this city. I think to all be clustered in here together, you know. I was in I, Paris I, for a, for a month. And as Tom was saying, you know, everyone knows it's the most gorgeous city I've ever seen in my life. And but I, I did look around. I rode on their subways. I went all over Paris on the subway. And I was like, there's something missing about this place. I could never live here. And I'm like, there's no energy here. None. And it's like New York's energy comes from its people. Yeah. And that's why it's unthinkable to me to ever leave. I could never leave uh, permanently, you know. 
And there does seem to be a real sense of post-pandemic kind of revelry and, and excitement that everyone's like able to see and touch and be around each other again. I mean, we're not out of the woods, of course, and there's still, you know, if, if we have to go back and, and we have to sh shelter ourselves again or, or, you know, cloister ourselves again, that would be horrible. But, but there is a, a magic in the streets. It's always been what's been alluring about New York. And I read a book called Vanish in New York years ago about gentrification and things like that's that a good used. book. That's Great a good book, book based on a blog, a terrific blog. And, um, yeah. and, you know, one of the things he talks about in the, in the book is the fact that, you know, people have always been lamenting the, the death of New York. And then what part of what makes New York such a dynamic, vibrant city is the fact that it's constantly changing and that there's turnover a lot with businesses and a bar that has been around for 50 years will close and that sucks. But then another great bar will take its place. But like, it is constantly changing the city, you know, and, the first time I talked to Kevin, he mentioned Robert Moses, and that got me looking into, I mean, if yeah. anyone's lives were changed, it was by that dude, yeah. who like pretty, pretty much built over entire neighborhoods. Wasn't uh, South, where your, your family's from the South Bronx, Kev? Yeah, yeah. So it wasn't, didn't, didn't the freeways go through their, their little areas? Uh, the Cross Bronx Expressway. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, that was... Uh, I guess it started in the early fifties and it, it took 10 years and it was just like, you know, um, well, I don't, I mean, just like, I, I, I maybe not at all like, but uh, just, just in terms of the scale of the project, you know, like the second Avenue subway and how long that's, I mean, that's taken like decades and decades. So the cross Bronx expressway, I don't know how long it was, it took to form the idea that might have been just something you know Robert Moses came up with like we're going to do this and it got done in in 10 years at the at the cost of like uh, the, the the lives and the security of so many people I and mean, it's not really my story to tell I'm not an expert on it but there are some people who are uh, um uh, what was that there's a book about it uh all that rises melts into air. That's the title. The author, you can look it up. That guy, he, you know, is a crusade against like the memory of, of Robert Moses and what he did to this city. But I, I happen to know like uh, uh, that, uh, that that did cut through um, my I, my parents' neighborhood where they grew up and. It was kind of in the background of their lives, the way sometimes you see, you know, World War II stories about some, you know, kids, you know, from London, Pink Floyd, the wall, right? You know, playing around in the rubble left behind by the, uh, by the bombing and all that. And uh, uh, my father talks about, you know, playing in the rubble of the, the Cross Bronx Expressway as it was being built and all those neighborhoods in the South Bronx were being just vaporized Jesus. Uh, not his. He, my father's building is still standing. There's still like all these buildings are gone. His is still there on uh, 296 Brook Avenue. I've been around there lately. And um, but yeah. Uh, um, it. Uh, there was like a, a thriving energy. There was community. There was like a. Uh, there were people, there was life and, and, um, and, and that whole thing was upended. And, and, uh, and then you had like the sixties and the seventies and all the, 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 the arson and the, the landlords, you know, uh, making deals with the gangs to go and like burn the buildings and, you know, uh, uh, and, um, and so that they could sort of just cash out and, and leave. And that went on for years, no, like from like the early 60s and no one really talked about it until uh, Howard Cosell said the Bronx is burning uh, uh, in 1977 on live TV when the Yankees, it took the Yankees getting into the World Series for the, for, for the, the nation and the world to, to know what was going on there. However, by that time, you know, the young people, some, you know, groups managed to, to uh, derive uh, artistic inspiration from it. And, and, you know, rap music came out of it and, you know, graffiti art and 
who knows what else, you know, it was like a spirit of the 60s. It kind of just sort of swam under and then it came back up in the 70s and it was like, you know, there was like uh, the disco and punk and, you know, all the things that uh, were the subject matter of independent film for the, the past 25 years, you know? Um, um, well, that that's what's, I think that's not, I don't keep going, Kevin, cut me off if I, as I'm cutting. No, I, you know, uh, well, that's what stopping. I think, that's what I like about, and this kind of would segue into one of my favorite scenes of, of the, of the movie. I, I, I want to talk about a few of my favorite scenes, but it's the scene when, when Paul and Kevin are, you know, they're talking a bit about the link between um, the Old Testament and New Testament, but then for Paul to sit there and say, I think a very startling, startling line, shocking line, which is this, this, this pandemic, this virus is the best thing that's ever happened in the city. Like, I love the way Paul Max says it. I love just how shocking it is and how morbid and, 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 and terrifying the comment is. But the, and the idea, and then, you know, Paul being a non-believer, for him to say, you know, to say, look, this thing, it could rise up like an ashes, like, like Jesus, like a yeah. resurrection. I just, I mean, again, I'm not a, I'm not a deep thinker. I'm not a complex thinker, but I think you can just say a lot with a little, with a, a couple of lines like that are so charged with meaning that you can, that they can just segue into a lot of conversations. And you know, we're all already having conversations about what's going to be the roaring, twi roaring 20s culturally of New York. I mean, these may be a little bit uh, premature to say these things, but like, you know, Kevin, go ahead, interrupt. No, there, there, you reminded me, there's a scene in Once Upon a Time in America when uh, they're shaking down uh, Treat Williams and he's like running for mayor or governor or something and they they, they, uh, they kidnap him, they're in a garage and and then they, they, they take the tape off his mouth so he can have some water or something and he's like, I'm gonna fucking, I'm, I'm gonna take you guys down or whatever he's, defiant you know and they're like yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh james woods has the line he's like this country's young there's a lot of diseases that it still yeah. you know needs to get before it can before it can what i don't know like it's i've always it's one of the questions that yeah. the movie has left me with is like what does that mean and i've heard you know you've heard it we've all heard it like you know the the um what do you call that the uh, uh um trope or the whatever of um of uh you know you're young you get these things when you're young you know the chicken pox or whatever you know a nation is young it has like some you know there's an original sin the original sin of slavery you know the original sin of of um whatever it's like does it ever really go away do we ever have we stopped sinning yet did we graduate to that did we get over all those evils and all those diseases that were supposed to be so normal like uh this happens you know corruption happens it ha you know it's like you you put a government together and you know you, you become a successful nation how do you think it got that way how do you think it got that on way? the backs of our people you know it's like uh it, it's like um yeah uh, a lot of people had to die from, yeah. for, uh, you know, for, for uh, me to become a big shot. I forget what character that is, Jack Nicholson and The Departed, you know. Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, uh, you don't get to be, you know, uh, the, the top without, uh, you don't get something for nothing. <laughs> but it seems like a lot of these characters in the film, they're driven by a sense of nostalgia. I mean, I find myself thinking of I once had a shrink say to me it's he's still my shrink he said do, do you live in the past and I was so angry at that comment I was like of course I fucking live. you know like I'm revisiting all the great memories that I have that have like brought me to this point and and I miss all the dead people that you know used to be in my family and uh and it's just it's I I guess that's what resonated with me with this but there's so much uh you can't bring the past back but what it did I've always been nostalgic for times where people did talk to one another, where people weren't looking down at phones and when they weren't preoccupied. hundred, hundred percent. Absolutely. I, um, well, first of all, just for the movie going experience, I want to go back to the times where we can walk into a movie theater and, and I have to ever have to worry about seeing a light shining. You know, I, mm -hmm. I the whole idea of the t t cell phones, just a, an anthem to me and I hate it, but I love the movies of the 90s, um, movies like, I don't know, it's the popped in my head, like, uh, The Big Kahuna with um, Danny DeVito and 
and and uh, who else is in this movie? Danny DeVito and, and Kevin Spacey. It's just uh, three people in a hotel room talking. It's just great. Um, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, um, Henry Full, which which, which Tom and, and and Kevin were both in. Just movies that were quiet movies based on dialogue that took their time and that were real performance driven indie movies. The movies of Whit Stillman, you know, um, Barcelona is one of one of my favorites. Um, I, I mean, in, in, certain, in terms of being nostalgic for that type of film, absolutely, I wanted to make that with this. I wanted to work with actors that I really love and just say, look, let's just get a lot of mileage out of the close-up and their abilities as actors. And I feel like, uh, I don't know if the cell phone has caused this, but the, vying for people's attention has become such a desperate thing that is, it's seeped into filmmaking where everything has been so sped up in terms of just to keep people watching, you know, and everything is visual and everything is spectacle. And I, I don't know, I wanted to make something that was just slower and more um, technical, performance driven, you know? So in that sense, I did want to make a movie that felt like it was something from the 90s. You know, I, I cut my teeth on indie movies from the, I guess, 90 to 95 is when I discovered, um, you know, Richard Linklater and, you know, and, and Spike Lee and, 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 and movies that were a little bit off the beaten path. And I don't know, I was, I was trying, we were, I think we were trying to make something that kind of conjured those kind of feelings, you know, from, from, from decades before, you know, there's only a little bit of technology in the movie. Um, but but other than that, yeah, we want it to be very intimate, um, conversational, you know. So. Well, I don't want to keep you guys here forever, and you could you could come or you could go or whatever. But I'm really I got to tell you, this was uh, such this has been a real honor for me to talk to all of you guys. You know, I've seen the film so many times in the last week that uh, I almost feel like I'm with, uh, you know, like if I was given the chance to meet with the four principals and on the waterfront, you know. But here I get two priests. Huh. That's amazing. Can I ask you a question, Stephen? Like, because you watched it several times, do you, do you feel like? Because when I watch the movie, every time I watch it, I'm in awe of it. I don't feel like I directed it in a lot of ways because I, I mean, we did we shot the movie in ten days. We didn't prep the movie very, very. We didn't have a lot of time to prep it. Mm -hmm. We showed up, and I, whatever happened, happened. Do you feel like watching it several times was it a matter of um, an appreciation for just these performers, right, and what they're able to do? as actors right because as i'm watching it seeing what they're doing i'm in awe of it like when you ask what one of our favorite scenes was i'll, I'll just say i'll be very quick about this scene where kevin and, and paul are talking in the church and they're talking about the connection between old testament and new testament i think it's a beautiful moment for both of them tom's moment when um there's talking about the end of the world if the world were to end would you want to be here in your lifetime tom has a wonderful moment there where he's he, the, he imagines the end of the world, imagines being here when it happens, imagine, imagines maybe Jesus coming back. And he, and there's a moment of joy on his face that just kind of wilts away into nothing. I don't know if you remember this shot. It's like a 40, it's like a 40 second shot. We stay on his face. And, it's, and, and in that shot, Tom goes from, you know, a curious to completely, uh, he's got tears in his eyes. He's joyful. And then when he realizes that the world might not end, during his lifetime, he just wilts. He just wilts like a dying plant. It's just, it's a beautiful moment. That moment- That's over dinner. Day, That's after the, after they were really digging into each other. Yeah. And then, and then Tom, of course, uh, crying uh, about Father Brooks um, um, and uh, uh, Tom and his moments with Craig Bierko during the baptism scene are amazing yeah. to me. And then Max at the, at the uh, end of the movie when he's crying on the beach, I think is a really, really beautiful moment. And I think, and, 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 and I just think the whole thing is, is beautiful, but I, my, I, it changes. I have so many scenes from the movie that I like, and um, I, I just love all of it. You know. Well, so, yeah. What if I told you that I was just so stoned three of the times I had to keep watching it? <laughs> or you? Or did you watch it stoned? Because I, I wonder how it plays. Probably, yeah. Stone. I think it oh, was. That's great. Well, I did, but it's never to the point where I'm like not there. It'll, I just, I just take, I need the edge off. But no, but I, you know, I, I, I thought that uh, it was. I, I, I didn't that, pick up on a lot of the intricacies of, of Max's stuff in some viewings. And then I would pick up something completely different from watching, you know, Thomas's, you know, performance or Kevin's. It's like, there's, there's a lot there that you can revisit, you know? Um, I do, uh, you know, 
Well, I will really? say that I, I think that Kevin and Max and Tom, and especially when it, it's Kevin and Max, there's something old school about it. it almost feels like Pacino, De Niro, with I mean, they're their own people. They're, I mean, it's, it's Max, quintessentially Max, quintessentially Kevin. Yeah. But I think there's something old school, new school New York about it that just feels like vintage, raw, amazing actors, you know? And like, sure. as I'm watching it, I'm just like, I can't believe we made this because it feels so classic and it feels so raw and it feels timely. Like, I think this film will play beautifully in 10 years and 20 years, you know what I mean? If we're all still around then, you know, it's all. Uh, did we I don't need see to an be iPhone in this order. film? We don't need to be here. Okay. That's the thing about the film is that the film will speak for us. So yeah. uh, it will. It, it can't be killed. It's there, you know. Yes. And uh, I think that you know, I'm remember. I'm trying to remember that with this film, when you know things come and go so quickly, and it's like you, it's not appreciated the way you want it to be appreciated, or whatever. You know, it's just not important in the long in in the long run you know we'll the the film speaks for itself every time i see it something else strikes me as you guys have said when we watched it the other night at the screening the line that i loved most was max with his girlfriend what is the button on the end of that scene she uses a fancy word and he said what is what is um, it what an antithetical, antithetical. <laughs> what does antithetical mean it was yeah. so perfect because it was just like you're talking so much that I can't even, I, I don't know. The fact is, I don't know. I can't know. You know, it reminds me of what's the Woody Allen movie where he has the crisis of faith um, because he thinks he has a brain tumor. Hannah. And he decides oh, he's going to try all these different religions. Um, I think it's Hannah and her sisters. And, her sisters. Um, and, his, and, and he tries Catholicism and he tries to be a Buddhist and he try, it's all ridiculous. And he's talking to his Jewish father about, I'm going to be a Catholic. And he says, how can you be a Catholic? It's ridiculous. And he says, well, I don't know. I want to, I want answers like for in a basic way, like why were there, why were there Nazis? And the father says, how do I know why there were Nazis? I don't know how the can opener works. <laughs> and I just thought that's so wise. It's like, I can't answer it. I can't, I can't take it on. I'm just a person. I'm just doing the best I can. And so Kev and Max's whole playing of that, I love this whole scene. She's great in it too. And and the, the the questions she raises are very legitimate things. She brings up one point after the next that I'm going, yeah, she's right. She's absolutely right. These are really intelligent arguments. And then at the end, he's just sitting there naked like, I can't, I don't know. I don't need, what does that mean, that word? It's it's just, it's very good on her, very good oh, writing. Man. I thought she was taking him to task. I wanted her out, like, I was like, I want Max to say, all right, go to go to Utah, get out of here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. You know, well, it's interesting. I, sometimes I think Paul maybe came to the church because, you know, he is now seen or thinks he has the answers. He knows there's a soul. He knows there's an afterlife. So he's come to the church to reconnect with Kevin, probably uh, with Father Andrew, because probably he's lonely and everything. He's looking for companionship. But also he feels like he has a leg up on the priest. Like he's there to almost challenge their certitude because he himself is so certain that he knows something. He knows there's a soul. And, you know, when he gets that knowledge, when he actually finds out for himself what it feels like, he'd wish he hadn't experienced it because it, 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 it's not what he expected it to be. And it actually ends up causing his downfall. But it's so funny because I, I wasn't aware of it. I wasn't cognizant of it when I was writing it. But I feel like that might have been one of the reasons Paul is, has come to the church, too, is to say, let me give you all some wisdom or let me show you something maybe you all didn't know you know and i love it because at the at the end of the day when he shows it to them they're skeptical they're you know and then he even tells them you guys would be skeptical if jesus came back like yeah. you're not you you guys are you, well, you're all, you're not even you're not even certain of your own beliefs and um and i love all those things and you know when, I, when i'm right at it my, my the, the guy who i co-wrote the story with andrew shemin uh, he shot the movie. He's a producer on the movie. He uh, he's a Catholic polymath. He's a brilliant, brilliant guy. And like he and I would would email each other pages. I would email him pages of questions. He would email me pages of of information about Catholicism and the and, and the reason why he became uh, Catholic and his own relationship with his parents. So that that stuff was indispensable to me writing the script. You know what I mean? And I, and I had of course like writing the 
so many scenes, you know, um, Kevin's feedback and Max and Tom's feedback. Like, I feel lucky that I was to call myself the writer of the script, but I had so much, so much help. I mean, Paul Reiser you know, with his scene, yeah. well, he and I did 11 versions, drafts of his scene. Like, you know, he's a great writer. And he was like, what do I want to, re- I'll do the movie, but I, I want to rewrite my scenes. I'm like, of course. And we went back and forth on this. So I, I feel like very lucky to call myself the, a writer, but at the same time, I feel so removed from it, you know? Um, you should so. keep writing good scripts. I'm going to try. It's, it, should. It, it helps when you have uh, great actors who will take it and just it tr- transcend it to another Especially level. Especially if you took it to a level that they weren't used to. I think Thomas said, like, this was coming from owner. You know, I've seen your other films. You know, they're uh, yeah. they're rather blue and, and nihilistic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want to keep making things that are a little more positive. But, like, you know, the I, I, I tend to uh, – I thought I'd be – I get bitter. I'm like, this movie doesn't get the, re- it doesn't get, it's not getting the reaction it deserves. It's not getting, we're not getting the appreciation it deserves. I'm just going to write something really angry again because I'm angry, you know? And I'm like, I don't want to go into the, my next film with that. But, uh, but you know, it's the self-importance. It's all driven by ego. And I'm, I, and I just have to like extricate myself. From I think I all your good intentions and everything good was in the script and i think that says something about where you're going after this i don't know oh, you. you know you're still gonna have the great line like max's response to you know his girlfriend's uh very long-winded response and he says suck my cock you know, yeah, like, right yeah. yeah that's, that's always gonna be there for you <laughs> that that's gotta be there because it's like okay someone can say that's misogynistic but that's not mm-hmm. misogynistic when you when you're you you're allowed to ask that of your lover when you're in an intimate relationship there's nothing and i don't i, don't, I, I never want to shy away from things that i think ride the line between good taste and absolute bad taste you know right. what i mean like i always want to ride the line so yeah well everyone will see this i'm i'm really I'm grateful that you guys came on. This it's was, really nice great. that you're cha- you're championing this, Stephen. It really means a lot. I uh, I don't care if I get any recognition for the film, but to, I want these these three gentlemen who are so brilliant that to, to you know, and I think eventually the, it will survive, and I think people will eventually see it. It might take a little time, you know. So. I'll 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 harass anybody you want, you know. <laughs> I appreciate that. You know, Max, yeah. I'm so fascinated that you were raised by commies and and married a a Haredi girl, or maybe she wasn't. But she wasn't no, but her father uh, was right. Is is still yes. You know my my first tr- that same trip that I bought some grass, some weed from some dude in Washington Square. I I took a train down to Crown Heights with my former camp counselor to go see the Lubavitcher Rebbe speak. I'm 14. I was very you know I wanted they were exotic to me these uh, black yeah. hat where and that they were Jewish and I was like wow. I guess I'm like these people because, you know, but I wasn't. So it was very exotic and very moving. But, you know, once I got to a certain age and wasn't as religion, like girls and music and stuff, but it's always sat with me. But I it also, I, I tell people because I don't really, I look very fair haired and blonde. And so I act like, you know, I says like a, a light skinned African-American who loves the darkest sister, you know? because yeah. he wants to get more into his, his roots. I've always been like that with Judaism, but always felt like kind of an outsider. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. But guys, thanks for coming, owner, if how, you want to stick real around. quickly though, Stephen, how long were you married? Do you mind if I ask? No, you can ask me anything. How long were you married? I think six or seven years. And when did you get divorced? Uh, 2014. Mm. Still friends with her? I, well, we have a 10 year old, so we have to oh, be, okay. It gets okay. easier and easier every year. Uh, and, you know, I'd prefer not to fight. It's old habits die hard sometimes. Yeah, yeah. But, I, you know, I try to keep things in, uh, in perspective. But it's not easy, you know. And, and uh, then addressing my own cynicism going out into the world as a single guy, you know, I just sometimes prefer to be like the Paul character hanging out with, you know, clergy. And it just makes, that's where I'm at. That's probably why I identified with that character so much. Yeah. But uh, and Thomas, if I ever meet you, I'll, I, you're just a priest in my mind. I'm gonna have to start. I'm gonna have to watch Henry Fool again. <laughs> you yeah. know? It's like if I met- that, that should relieve you of my priest. Okay, uh, good, good, good. Uh, aura. Great to meet you, Stephen. God bless Thank you, you, sir. For, for championing. Great to meet you. Movie. Thank you so much, Thanks, you. guys. Kevin, it's always a pleasure. You, you look, look good. Boys. You look handsome. Bye, Max. Bye, guys. Bye. Owner, you, stick Steven. around for a second, okay. or if you want. Yeah, 
Yeah, let's hey, talk about the center scene right now. Yeah. Hey, Craig. Say, what camera am I on? Two? Am I on two or one? I'll look right down the barrel at three. Nice to meet you, Craig. I'd like to say. How are you? I'm great. I'm sorry, I'm early. Um, You're only an hour and a half late, Craig. Yeah, but it's I perfect know. timing. I know. I just, well, I, I didn't know that it was going to be tonight. Or you, what is, what's with the telling people about things while they're happening? I told you, no, I sent the link to you five days ago and you responded Get today off and my said, and you responded and said, oh yeah, I'd love to be a part of it. We had two hours before we did it. it. No one was part of it, no. Kevin, help me out. Are you, what happened to Kevin? Is he on something? He's Kevin's on there. We can't see you now. Yeah, you gotta <laughs> Here we go. Craig, listen, we're going to talk. We want to put you into the podcast. So let's talk about your uh, yeah. center scene. That was, that was some I'm scene. not, uh, I'm just well, not that into me. Let me get a. Let me the get interview, a the, the interview had been, had finished. And then, and then. So what, were you guys more, just, what, what were you guys doing? Then Steve's owner and I stayed on the line with Steve. Yeah. To Tubin? Yeah. Were you to Tubin? But now we're going to like go back to doing the interview. But yeah, now okay. Tom and Max are gone. <laughs> well, can Max? Oh, Stephen, is this going to be a pain in the ass for you to cut together? We don't have. No, to it's easy. You don't have to just, do this. It's so you simple. Do this. You don't have okay, to. It's so just nice just, to. It's nice to see it. You enjoy let's, it. Let's, let's, no, let's let's start it off. Let's do an interview. Let me just get thing. let me get my uh, lighting going here because I I honestly didn't think I was going to be able to. Let's talk about it. I'm going to start it off. Okay, you start so it off. You be the okay. moderator. So the, the one of the one of the scenes that wasn't ri written in the original script is the the baptism scene, and um, when I found out Craig wanted to be in the movie, I got to work writing the scene because uh, I knew there needed to be a scene in the movie that questioned the hypocrisy of salvation. You know, um, I mean, obviously forgiveness is a beautiful idea of Catholicism, but it could also be taken advantage of and people could use it to their advantage. You know, the idea of salvation, the idea of, of baptism, the idea of being forgiveness, if you ask for forgiveness, would allow monstrous people maybe to do things and then say, I'll just, I'll, you know, I'll be able to ask for forgiveness later and, and that'll be that. So that was the basic idea behind it. I, uh, and then when we, when we had a reading, so I wrote the scene for Craig, we had a reading of the scene at the church and the original version of the scene was very, very funny. There was a lot of punchlines and a lot of humor. And as we were reading it, like Craig and all the other actors suggested that we tone it down and make it a lot more dramatic. It'd be a lot creepier if we did that. And, and I think it turned out really well. I didn't know really how Craig was going to play it. And he could speak to what the hell he was thinking when he, when he, when he, he, when he you know, decided to play the sinner. Because I think it's just ghoulish and creepy and funny. Uh, and if you can be funny and scary at the same time, oh man, I, I, I just you're think, Griffin uh, Dunn, huh? <laughs> you're Griffin you are Dunn. Griffin Dunn. Uh, Dread Central. There's a horror website that said that they call that said that, that they call the movie a horror film because the pandemic is, was a horrible time to go through. But they said there's only one horror horror true horror scene in the movie, and it's uh, a Craig scene. You know? Oh, they consider it a horror scene. Yeah, I think it is. A lot. I think it's the most evil character I've definitely ever read, uh, written. I don't know if it's the most evil character you've ever played. You think it is? It's he's certainly down there. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I, I don't know. I think some of it is. I mean, I've played characters that were out and out evil, and they could list the things that they've they've done. And this guy does name something that he's done. And you know, I mean, this is okay to say. I mean, the one, you know, directors, the director wins, right? And I think you were actually, you had a valid point, so it was correct. But I, I like the idea of never learning quite what this guy did. And I think some of it came from, uh, my feeling about the part was was this. He, he owner had written something that was that was very funny and it did fit in, but it was sort of part of this parade of people who, are coming in to uh, the church. And uh, it just so happens this guy wants something that's uh, on the face of it, uh, dishonest and anti-church. Anti and I, I guess he has some sort of, the way you wrote it, he had some sort of point to make, which is if you're like any other business, you gotta keep the lights on, just needed to prove that point. 
and uh, here's some lettuce, right? Yeah, and, that's what. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think when and I and I I've worked with owner before, and I I honestly do believe, and I I I think I, I'm just getting to know Kevin, but I we exchange uh, silly emails a lot, and some of them aren't that silly, and I'm very familiar with his work. I told him when we worked together that I had always been looking forward to uh, to working with him, and I think there are certain artists, uh, certainly writers that kind of have an antenna up. They might not even be conscious of it, I don't know. But they're, if you've probably met people like this, they, they might not be artists, they're people who kind of, they can taste something that's about to happen. It's very helpful as an artist because you you just sort of can hook up to something that's that's in the zeitgeist. You know, you sort of have these invisible guardrails. I don't know if I'm being very clear or if you feel this about yourself, Kevin, but as an observer, it's one of the things that I think always drew me to you as an artist was I just felt an absolute uh, honesty and, it, and, and which probably comes from a uh, having that antenna up, but I'm not as familiar with that in actors as I am in writers, that's where I first discovered what I feel is an actual phenomenon, which is there are certain writers that just have their antenna up. You know who's one of them? Uh, it, was, it wasn't what I expected, but it, uh, David E. Kelly, who writes uh, a series a week, you know, longhand on legal paper. Have you ever worked with David Kelly? I, I haven't, no, no. He's, I, I, if I you, I mean, he's, he's, a, I mean, forget the fact, you know, he's been, he, forget surviving in this business in, in a very big way and, and thriving actually. Um, but he does everything himself. And the, and the one thing I noticed about being on that show, I was on Boston Legal for a while. And, and the one thing I noticed about being on that show and other people noticed it too. So I knew I wasn't uh, nuts was that whatever they were going through in their life, it made its way into the, the show. And with a show like that, where you've got a carousel of characters that are constantly turning over stories and whatever revelations about their characters that, you know, you're, you're, there's so much to plow through um, that as a writer, uh, and he, I, I think he, I mean, I know he had writers writing with it, but he largely wrote alone. And if he had, and if the staff wrote something, he would just take it and rewrite it himself anyway. Uh, he couldn't help himself. It's sort of, I recognize that in owner who can write a script in less time than it takes to watch a movie. He can write, he can write a script. It's kind of incredible. He wrote my scene in a night and then he rewrote it in a night, right? Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, it crazy. Pretty quickly. yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it was crazy. Um, but and I, I just I, feel like I've been I don't pretend to understand it. God knows I've eaten up a lot of Zoom tape trying to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> or is it Zoom vellum? What are we on? What do we use here? Zoom vellum? Yeah. But but I I I feel like there are writers, and I do feel like owner, owner is is one. My experience with them is that there's just a little. It's almost like it, like if it's about to rain, you can test the taste the uh, the ions or you know what <laughs> yeah, I mean. Right. Yeah. That's what it feels like, and I've had plenty of conversations with them, ninety percent of which are worthless, and I'm not even facing him. <laughs> but the ten percent that's of interest to me contains nuggets of information, you know. That that that's I'm I'm kidding him because it's a relationship. I I have an enormous amount of respect for for both of these guys, and I do notice that with both of them, and I. I, it's funny, I'd worked for a year, well, almost a year with, uh, with Max doing Music Man, which is a whole different thing. And we hardly ever talked to each other, even though we played, played best friends in the play, but we were on such different tracks, you know? Once you get into a play, you can go, you can do a play and never see anybody um, until you're on stage. But I was watching the movie, and I, I don't know if, it's, if it has to do with the same thing, but... I, that I was trying to describe, but uh, I'd seen things in, in his performance that I had never noticed in him as an actor before. I'd seen him in The Soprano. I knew he, Sopranos, I knew he could be terrifying, but I wasn't as familiar. He wasn't, he didn't scare me in Doogie Howser a little bit. A little bit, I got nervous. I got nervous, but I didn't get scared. But 
And he didn't scare me in this. There were a couple of moments where I got a little afraid for the girlfriend when I first saw it, because he's very volatile and alive, you know, and and uh, and he's off the booze, you know, so that it just seemed like he was a, a loose cannon ready to go. I know when I was reading the script, I got nervous when he started drinking again. The thing I was going to say about about him that I noticed was there's a haunted quality to him in this. Like he actually looks haunted. Yeah. yeah. And I, I like think there were is, moments where I, thought, I mean this, he, I don't mean this like he was aping anybody, but like I saw moments of like De Niro where the guy was in such pain that was inarticulable. And thank God he had a friend like, you know, Kevin's character, someone who's so compassionate and eventually won over, you know, the other, the other priest. But when he hit the bottle, when I read it, for my own reasons, it, I found it terrifying. And I absolutely thought, and I do think this was, this is, I'm, I'm bringing it all around right now. Mm -hmm. I do think on an unconscious level, uh, owner connected my character to the film, which when I first read it, I thought, this is going to get cut. It'll be good on my reel, but it's going to get cut. When they have to cut for time, this will be the first thing to go because it's not attached to anything in the story. And then I read it again and I was paying particular attention to Max's character and I was watching him rehearse and stuff like that. And when he goes off the bottle, I sort of back on the bottle when he starts drinking, it's, it's terrifying to me because it's so simple. It's literally, you just have to tilt the bottle back and how many years, we never find out how many years he has, but whatever he's, whatever work he's done on himself, gone. And with drinkers, you may, it may be a fun night. He may never come back again. You know, it's one or the other. And, uh, you know, I don't think booze is evil, but I think there's evil out there that can corrupt people. And it can use booze to use whatever your weakness is. And I sort of, for my own purposes, I didn't play it. You don't have to when you're, when you're acting with somebody like uh, Kevin and also Thomas and and Max you just talk to them and whatever is in the script is going to come through but I felt very strongly when we were into when we were in an intellectual zone talking about the text I thought this is the evil that precedes Max's choice this is a moment that actually illustrates his weakness for me it helped it justified my my being there and it gave me it like widened my skating rink a little bit. Like there wasn't really anything I couldn't, it was there just, you know, I was there to fuck with them, obviously. Um, can I say obviously? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I thought so. I mean, you, you, I think you, you, you put the fucking fright into them and it landed them in confession. I mean, that was. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. It and was like, of... I felt like, it was like the. It was like the. It's, it was suddenly nineteen, you know, seventy six, and it, it was like, oh my god, it's the son of Sam. It's, it's, it's. You know what I was thinking was the stuff that was all current, which was we were right in the midst of the Epstein stuff. Mm. COVID had they hadn't moved COVID in front of the story, so we're not. Nobody's talking about Epstein or Dwayne Maxwell. It's all gone. We're all watching Channel COVID now. You know like they've distracted but at that point i found the whole epstein thing the it didn't get scary until he was suicided you know yeah. quote unquote when i realized because i and i don't want we don't have to get off on this thing but i felt like we tripped over a some kind of a structure and the fluorescent lights went on for a half second some of us saw the contours of something big that we didn't recognize and some of us most of us missed it but whatever he was a part of i think he was a lieutenant not even a very important part of it and um i just thought there are probably a lot of guys and gals who are out there who do this and i think i've met some i mean i i can't say for sure but I, i've certainly met people who or at like XMI6 and all that sort of stuff. And they don't talk about what they do or what they've done. And they say scary things. Like I've been out for 10 years, but they know exactly where I am. And because I'm sitting with you, they know who you are. Like, 
I never <laughs> looked at the world the same way after that. And and there's a line in the movie where I say, uh, if you knew the things I'd done, you'd you'd never you wouldn't sleep at night. That's what that guy said. To me. Those were that, and you put it in the script. That was the one thing you you caught, which was. I can't tell you what I've done. There were some famous stories he could tell me that gave me an idea, but mostly he's, he was MI6. He couldn't tell me what he had done like 10 years ago. And I just thought, I probably don't want to know, but at, at least I sleep, mostly. I don't know. What do you think of that shit, Kevin? Do you, do you follow any of that stuff or do you think I'm full of shit? I, I might follow it now. You, you let the the cat out of the bag. I have to go chasing it now. Oh, I don't think I will. I don't want to know either. I don't want to have. Kevin it. got me interested in a Super band called life. the Beatles. Have you ever heard of these yeah, guys? Yeah, I just heard oh, about them. Oh, they're great. They're going to be big. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs>